WGM from Los Angeles and I'm going to be doing a series on the Winnebar defense which arises after d4, e6, d4, d5, knight c3, should be 4. And this is the Winnebar variation of the French defense which is one of my favorite lines to play. Usually the comp positions are really complicated and that is what I aim for usually when I play. And today I'm going to be going over the sidelines in the winnower. The main position in the winnower is this, 5c5. And before I start going over the sidelines, just to talk about the dynamics of the main position. So this position is very closed and obviously black gave up the pair of bishops, but black is ahead in development and white's queen side is really weak, so this c pawn, double c pawn can become a problem if we ever go into an endgame and our rook is on the c file. But at the same time, white always has this annoying move, queen g4, putting pressure on the g7 pawn. So right away, black has some problems that he has to face. But since the position is so close, sometimes white likes to avoid it. And instead, they play different moves in this position, aiming for a more open position. And usually it involves the sacrifice of the e4 pawn. And obviously after bishop b4, the e4 pawn is hanging. So since I mentioned that queen g4 is the main line, there's two ways that white can try to play queen g4. So we can either go queen g4 first or play a3 first and force the exchange and then try to play queen g4 putting pressure on g7 pawn, which becomes really weak once the dark square bishop is gone because it's becoming hard to protect it. So let's start with a3. So we're going to take and then we're going to take the e4 pawn and now queen g4. So now White is attacking both pawns, which means we're going to lose one of the pawns. So winning the e4 pawn is usually temporary for black, so don't get too attached to winning a pawn, you're not going to always be up a pawn. And here we have this move, and actually we're going to give away our g7 pawn as opposed to the e4 pawn. It might seem a little counterintuitive, because it's our kingside pawn, and we know we shouldn't give up our kingside pawn, because then we don't know where to castle. But White is breaking one of the main opening rules by taking out the queen too early and taking a pawn that's and getting the queen attacked. So we know that that is not a good thing to do. So let's go back for a second to the main position that I talked about. So when we go e5, c5. Here again, white is taking out the queen too early, but difference is the queen is not going to get attacked because f6 square for the knight is gone and white, black has already committed the knight to e7. So this position is actually gives black more options because now I have this knight of 6 move. Here, here. So I just talk about the dynamics of this position. Obviously our king side is completely destroyed and our king might become a little weak but at the same time white's king is real very weak too. You can castle on the queen side because the queen side pawns are a lot weaker than our queen side and if he castles on the king side then we have our rook on the g file ready to attack. So it's really hard for a white to decide where to put their king. And also it's important here to not play rook g6 right away because this queen here is very misplaced so you don't want to chase it away because it's already not doing anything. So I think the best way to play here is just to play slowly and continue our development because we're already so developed and so far ahead so we should just continue it. So we're just gonna play knight bd7, knight e2 so white is trying to put the knight on g3 so the g2 pawn won't hang. Here, here, queen e7. So black's idea is just to play bishop b7 and castle and the pawn on e4 is really annoying for white because now the light square bishop doesn't have the d3 square which it likes attacking the h7 pawn. And now there's actually a little trick here. If white plays knight g3, we have this really strong move. And now black is just winning because after bishop e7, knight h6, this bishop is trapped. Bishop here, they're just going to trap the bishop. So for that reason, white plays queen h4, queen h4, bishop e7, knight g3. So now we're going to continue with our idea. We're going to play h6. And again, we can't take with the queen because the same thing will happen. And the bishop is trapped again. 
I'm taking with the bishop is dangerous because rook g4, now the queen is confined to the h3 square. And castle, and now rook h8 is coming, pinning this queen. Even though we sacrificed the pawn, we're way ahead in development. And white's pieces are really misplaced and none of them are really doing anything. So I think in this position black has more than enough for the pawn. So for that reason, after h6, bishop d2, rook g4. So we're just putting pressure on white's pieces and castle. And now white has few decisions to make. First they have to decide where the king is going and how the pieces are going to be developed. So c4, knight g8. And I think here already black has a really good position and as a French player if you ever get this position you're more than happy. I mean it won't happen very often, you won't be getting such good, great positions out of opening with black. But I'm going to stop here because I think it's pretty straightforward that what black wants to do when to play f4 and if it stops then e5. And just the basic principles of chess when your opponent doesn't castle you just try to blow up the center and put pressure on the king. And I think this position, just to stop here, is enough. I think everyone can agree that black has a good position. So I think this a3 move is not that great of a move. It's really shaky. So if you know how to react to it correctly, you should be okay. And there's really no need of knowing long, crazy lines. Okay, so going back to this position. Let's see, there should be four. So queen g4 right away. So I think this is another position. Another move for white that's a little suspicious because you shouldn't. Once I have the knight f6 move, I think taking the queen out early is not that great. But white is trying to uh, have a more open position because if you're going to get a pair of bishops, you want to have an open position because bishops don't do really well in close position. They need space to attack and show their strength. So again, we're going to give up our g7 pawn. And since we're still pinning, we're going to play in the center and we're going to put a lot of pressure right away in the center. Instead of taking wasting time on taking on e4, we're going to play c5. And now, obviously they can take it because we have this move. So now white has decisions to make. And slow moves like this don't work either because now I have e5 and the next move I'm going to play d4 winning a piece. And if white tries e4, then I take this. And this position, if we go here, this exchange, I think this endgame should be really good for black because I have a better pawn structure. My pieces are more active. My rook is already playing. My bishop is out. And this pawn is going to fall after knight d7. There is no way to protect this pawn. So I, I think this position is already good for black. So if they try a3, then we have this move. Again, exchange. So again, this is, I think, another position that's good for black, because I can play b6, trade my light square bishop, and then f6 pawn is going to fall. If he takes b takes c3, then these pawns are really weak. So when my rook comes c8, once I take these pieces out, for example, then these pawns are going to become problematic and the bishop on c1 doesn't really have a good place to go because so many of the pawns are on dark squares. So for that reason, if white tries to play a3, try to ease up the tension, going to play rook g6. So now there is no way white can take here because this is going to be with a tempo. And we have to be careful here Uh, a3. We don't want to go back bishop a5 right away because after d takes here we have like white has this move. And we don't want to trade this bishop for no reason. So for that reason we're going to make taking on c5 impossible. So bishop d2 trying to ease up the pin. Knight c6 here. Take and bishop g7. And from a dynamic perspective, black is completely dominating the board. So since the queen doesn't have any good squares, they have to take, take, and take here. And now bishop b6. And once the queen moves, let's say here, we'll take on d5. 
And all our pieces are out. Both our bishops are attacking the king side. Our rooks is on, a, on an open file, and we're putting pressure on this pawn. So we're down a pawn, but there is more than enough compensation for the pawn. We're definitely going to win one of the pawns back, and we're ahead in development. This king doesn't really have a place to go. Once the g2 pawn falls, the f2 pawn is going to fall too. So I think black is just completely dominating the board. And on top of it, the so-called bad French bishop, the c8 bishop is out, and we traded white's f1 bishop, light square bishop, which is one of white's strongest pieces. So I think this is another suspicious line for white, and I would if you're looking at it from the white side, I would not recommend playing this line because black just can get a really, like right away, it's all tactical, it's all forced. Black can get a really good position out of the opening and it's not something you want as white. Okay, so going back again. Instead of playing immediately, uh, trying to play actively, there are two other moves, bishop d2 and knight g2. So uh, this, I guess I'll put them in a category. It's just trying to ease up the tension of the pin. And the point of both of the moves is if black ever takes on c3, we want to take back with a piece because white doesn't want to have to commit to the bad queen side. And then now the bishop can come to b4 and be more active as opposed to other positions where white takes with a pawn and the c1 bishop doesn't have anywhere to go. So bishop d2, and again we're going to take this pawn. And very similar position to the ones we went over before. But now the bishop's on d2, so the pin is not very dangerous. And um, if we were forced to take there, white would take with a bishop, which is better for them. So there are two ways of playing here. If you want to draw the game, I think it's very easy to do after knight c6, castle. And here we have to be careful, you don't want to snatch the d4 pawn after white castle because it's going to be a really nasty pin. If you do something like this, probably after bishop g5 or even bishop f4, this is going to become very, very dangerous. So this is not the kind of pawn you want to snatch. I mean, I would never, I, I don't even have a line there because it's something I would never even consider taking a pawn like that. So and you shouldn't either. Some pawns are just really poisonous, should stay away from them. And here we can just queen h4. And queen e3 is impossible here. Well, not impossible, but now we can take the d4 pawn because the pin is not dangerous anymore since we're offering a queen exchange. And if the queen moves, which is already awkward, I can just move with my queen. So I just snatch the pawn and I'm not going to suffer the consequences because white couldn't take advantage of the pin right away. For that reason, queen h4, rook g4. And queen h3. Now we can go back to rook g6. And we have this really strong threat of playing e5 since the queen is on the diagonal. And black absolutely cannot allow that. If black plays like let's say here, here. And now our bishop is going to be out, the d4 pawn hangs, and the whole position is going to blow up soon. So white doesn't really have a choice but to go queen h4. So we can just repeat the position if you need to. But if you want to keep playing, you can also just take the pawn, since um, white hasn't castled yet. So, castle. So here, there's a bishop f8. There's a little trick there, don't get too greedy. Knight g4 here. And now, you cannot take this pawn, because you're simply going to get checkmated. Here, and a checkmate. I mean, if it weren't for this checkmate, obviously it looks like black is almost winning because e3 is coming and we offered a queen exchange. But unfortunately, shouldn't get too greedy. So bishop f8, queen h4, rook g4. So it's very similar to the same ideas we went over before, chasing away the queens. So now we're going to take another pawn, bishop e2. And at the first sight, it seems like black is already winning because this queen is trapped, but turns out our queen is going to get trapped because white has this trick. And then our queen is trapped. But then, since we're already upper rook, we have this move. I'm sorry, we have a queen for a rook. So we have this move. So now we're going to be down in exchange, but we have two pawns for a piece, a pair of bishops. So after, let's say, something like this, we can play a6. 
and then bring our bishop to c6, knight on d7. And this e4 pawn is really strong, it's a passed pawn. If we move the knight and start pushing our pawns, it can become a really strong force. So I think this is a very playable position. And I think both sides can try it. I don't think this position is very clear. I can't say someone is clearly better, but I prefer black. And if you don't want to draw quickly, I think I would suggest playing this position. I think black has really good chances here. So, going back again. Okay, so 92. I think the idea behind this move is pretty simple. If we ever take on c3, white is going to take with the knight, which will be the ideal solution, because then the e4 pawn doesn't even hang. So again, we're going to take the e4 pawn and a3. And there are two ways of playing here. We can, If you want easy equality, you can go back with e7. If you want a complicated position, if you want a uh, double edge play for a win, you can take the c3 knight. So, let's go to bishop e7. Takes, takes, knight g3 and knight bd7. And I think this position is very common. It's very similar to... If, I don't know if anyone knows this. So this type of positions, where knight f3, let's say bishop g5. But the difference is in the other position, let's say knight bd7, knight f3. And the knight is on f3 here. So that's the difference between the two positions. The knight here. Should be seven, takes knight f6. The knight is on g3. So the pos uh, the good side of it is that if we ever take on e4, the knight will come back on e4. But at the same time, this knight is not controlling the e5 square, and it can really jump to g5, which really decreases white's attacking chances. So I think this is going to be very easy equality, really fast, b6. And b6 is a very positional way of dealing with black's problem, because once we play e4, e6, this bishop becomes problematic. So if we can put it on b7 and exchange it, then basically all of our problems are solved. So actually we're going to castle first. Castle, castle, b6, queen e2, bishop e7. So I think this position is already very equal. Because we're going to just trade everything. Knight rook d1, rook d1 stopping c5. Knight e4, knight e4, knight f6. And I think this is already a pretty easy quality. White doesn't really have anything. It looks like white has some uh, space advantage, but there really isn't anything. So if you want easy quality, well, this is the way to go. But if you want complications, then your opponent is sacrificing a pawn, so you should accept it. So we're going to take, take. And we're not going to play knight f6 because we don't want to get pinned like this. And we don't have our f8 bishop, which is going to make the pin kind of nasty. So knight c6, putting pressure on the d4 pawn. Here, knight 7 And actually here, white can't win the e4 pawn back so easily because we have this really strong move. And if queen d3, then f5, and the g2 pawn is going to fall. So in this line, it's a little hard for white to win back the pawn. So that's um, where black's play is concentrating, trying to hang on to the pawn and see what if white can show anything for it. So bishop g5, f6, bishop b3. A white could have gone bishop e3 first right away. It doesn't really make that much of a difference, but he's trying to weaken our king side a little bit. So castle. So again, can't take this pawn because now I'll just have this. And then here, and all these pieces are starting to hang, and this hangs, this hangs, the pieces hang, just everything hangs. Position is like really loose. So again, it's really hard to win back the pawn. So queen d2, f5, castle, a6, takes, takes. So it looks like white is just down a pawn for nothing, but let's talk about white's ideas. So white's going to play f3, so obviously we're forced to take. White's hope is if we can put the bishop on f4, stopping us from playing e5, then this pawn is going to become a big problem. 
And since this pawn is such a big problem, it means this bishop doesn't have anywhere to go. And then white will have the g-file and opposite color bishops. And opposite color bishops are really good when attacking. Because if you're start attacking on the dark squares, then my light square bishop is going to become really useless and I won't be able to defend. But uh, fortunately, it's our turn. And we have this move e5. d5 here. Bishop g5. Queen d6. And I'm not sure if white has anything that much for the pawn. I think white has temporary, not advantage, but pressure. But I don't think the attack on g file is realistic, I mean, if the rooks are doubled. I just can play a rook f7. And it's hard to put pressure on the g7 pawn. And since the pawn is on e3, we have the idea of playing bishop d7, b5, and a5, and trying to push on this a2. So I think here white has to try hard to show what he has for the pawn. And I'm not sure if the knight g2, the sacrifice, is very sound for white. So I would not suggest it for white. And if you don't want to get into this position, if you think this is a little bit scary, then I think bishop e7 is just as good of a move as bishop c3. But I would suggest playing this line and just forcing white to show what they have for the pawn. Okay, so now there are two more moves left that I played in this position. So we went over two moves, which included um, going straight for the attack and sacrificing this pawn, and then two moves that try to ease the tension of the pin and take back on c3 with a piece. So now there are two more moves that just trying to defend the e4 pawn, because the e4 pawn is hanging. So there's queen d3 or bishop d3. So queen d3 looks a little silly because we're stopping the, blocking the f1 bishop and we know we're not supposed to defend pawns with a queen and I think everyone's initial intuitive reaction would be just to take and play here because now we win to tempi, we take on e4 with a tempo and we play knight f6 with a tempo but this is the kind of thing that white wants so this is exactly what you shouldn't do because after queen h4 now white has all kinds of ideas of playing bishop d3 and bishop g5 and you might find yourself under attack right away. So instead of doing what white wants to happen, we're going to play a really quiet move here, knight e7. A knight on e7 is a really good place for a knight. It's very flexible. It can go to c6 or f5 or g6, depending what white does. So instead of playing knight f6 where we can get attacked, we're just going to make a quiet move and see what white can do. So if... Let's say bishop d2, castle, a3. So white achieved what white wanted to achieve. They took back on c3 with a piece, and they got the pair of the bishops. But here after b6, we're going to play bishop a6 and exchange these bishops. And I think black just doesn't have any problems. I know this is not much of a line, but it's just one of the basic ideas of French, and I think it really shows what this line is really about. Once you can um, castle safely and exchange the c8 bishop with the f1 bishop, black should be okay. And let's say queen g3. So if we exchange this bishop. So this knight on a6, uh, whenever you exchange this bishop like this, remember, this knight belongs on c6. So if the position happens, uh, let's say here, you're going to play here and then you're going to come back and go back to c6. And it looks like you wasted a tempo, but it's worth it. Well, not always, but here it's worth it because you exchanged your bad bishop. And now we're going to start putting pressure on d4. So don't put your knight on c7 because it's not going to be anything, be doing anything there. So your knight belongs on c6. So it's okay to waste that tempo or even like two moves here and go back to c6 because that's where your knight needs to be. So I know this wasn't really complicated or line and it wasn't like deep analysis but it's just uh, I think this move is so harmless that you don't really need to know a lot you just need to react correctly which is to not take on e4 and it's just a game and I think black has, should be okay here already because most importantly we get to exchange this bishop okay our last move we're going to go over is bishop d3 so bishop d3 we're going to take take and knight f6. And the popular move here is bishop f3, which I think is very artificial looking. This is not where the bishop belongs. 
Usually, bishop needs to be on this diagonal, attacking. But we have to be careful here, because we have to react really well to this move. Because if you don't, even though the bishop is artificial here, he's still attacking on this diagonal. So if you don't play very actively, start making passive moves, then your c8 bishop is going to become a problem. So again, we're going to play in the center. c5. Knight here, here, e3. We're going to take, take, and now we're going to solve our biggest problem in the French defense, and we're going to free our bishop. And once this bishop gets out, then you're definitely not going to have any problems. And of course, this does not work, because we're going to win our pawn right away. And now it's going to lead into an opposite color bishop endgame. It's very symmetrical on the queen side. We have a symmetrical pawn structure, so I think this is just very equal position and there's nothing to worry about here at all, at all. So this is not what White is hoping for when playing this opening. But I think this position already, Black uh, should already be at least equal. We gave up a pair of bishops, but we're solving this problem again. So now e4 is a threat trying to trap the bishop. So White has to take, take, castle, take, take, and castle. And next move, we're going to take our bishop out on probably a6. And if he takes here, bishop a6. And um, losing this pawn doesn't even count. It's a double pawn, and it's not really going anywhere. But now we have, uh, again, we have activity. And it's one of the basics of the winnower. Black usually just plays for activity. You want to be able to take out your pieces really fast. Even in the main line, we're able to take out our pieces really fast. And you're just trying to... Start putting pressure on your opponent's position. Even if they get this pawn, it's it's nothing to worry about. So instead, if here, we give on bishop a6, and now there's going to be a lot of trades, and this is another equal position that you should be really happy with if it ever happens in your game. So instead of playing this bishop f3 move, which is not it just doesn't look natural at all. And as white, I think it's a really hard move to make. To put your bishop on f3. There is another move. Takes, takes. There is this move, bishop g5, which looks more logical. But usually this move makes more sense when there's a knight on the e4. So this pin is actually has a point. But now since there is no knight on e4, this pin is really harmless. So we're going to, again, we're going to play in the center, because we can. So knight f3, going to take, take, and get the sound. So like I said, this pin is really harmless, and now black is getting ready to play h6. So if white takes on f6, so let's say castle, well castle is not, because h6, and there's no bishop h4, because you're going to lose a piece, and now this hangs. So the point of knight bd7 is, if you take here, I'm going to take back with a knight, and my now, now I have the pair of bishops, so now my position is really comfortable here. And I can take this bishop out, take this out, and you shouldn't have any attack without the other bishop. So black has really nothing to worry about here. So let's say if knight d2, so again trying to take on c3 with a piece. Let's say this. Castle. So now we're definitely going to exchange the light square bishop because it doesn't matter where he goes, we'll play knight e6 and we'll just take it, or if bishop d3, we'll take it. And without this bishop, again, without this, there's definitely no attack here. Probably better to go to f3. Let's say something, for example, something like this. Now again, I'll take my bishop out, put it on c6, so I'm going to be the one putting pressure on your position. So, this is another really good position for white. Remember, whenever you exchange your c8 bishop for the f1 bishop, it's already good for you. Well, that's a little bit of a general statement, but that's already an achievement for black. If you, there are no consequences. And here, not only did you exchange white's really strong bishop, you exchanged it for a knight, which gave you two bishops, and your bishop is going to get out which means you just have the two bishop advantage. 
So I think this Bishop D3 move is not very ambitious. Maybe White can try it just to see if they can throw you off with this Bishop F3 move. But again, a matter of just reacting correctly and playing active, playing in the center, trying to solve your problems right away. And it just should be another easy activity for Black. So those are all the main sidelines of this position. Uh, in the next series, I'll talk about e5. And before diving into the queen g4 positions, I'll talk about the sidelines there. So thanks for listening in and tuning in the other video so we can learn more about the French defense.